Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. You've got Bryn Kelly and Michael Korn here after a brief vacation last week. We're back again to talk about natural gas, the crazy natural gas markets, and touch on some various things in oil. So, hello, Mike. Good morning. Hey, good morning, Bryn. How you doing? I'm doing good. All right, so let's get these weekly gas numbers out of the way first, um, since they just came out. I think the market, the futures for the weekly futures went out last night trading. I think they were minus 68. So they were calling for a draw of 68 and it came in at a draw of 58. So here's a couple of things I want to point out about these weekly numbers, because I always see things right after the number is posted. Like, I don't understand why the market's, you know, not going lower. That was a bearish number or vice versa. And and the thing is, you know, this one weekly number, as you can see from, you know, over here on the right side, it is not changing, you know, the picture of, of where storage is. So I think it's good to look at them and, and people are very interested with, with where the actual reported number is versus what the models were predicting because it helps them calibrate their model. But you know, the big picture is also important as well. And so you kind of have to ask yourself, did it change anything? Does, did that 10 miss change anything for, um, you know, where we're at in inventory levels? And, and I, I would argue, no, I'm not saying that means prices should go higher or lower. It just didn't change anything in the scheme of things. However, had we come in, so, so this next chart is the cumulative three week to date winter storage um, changes. And had we come in at the 68 or anything, you know, greater than a six, uh, withdrawal of 62, 2018 winter to date would have been the highest cumulative draw um, in the last six years and, you know, of at least the 2012 to 2000 now period. Um, and so as it stands now, 2014 is still a little bit of the front runner. Um, as of this time in 2014, we'd drawn down 157 and this year we're at 153. But this picture tells more of the story, right, than just the weekly number. Um, couple things in 2014 we were at higher started with higher levels um, at the beginning of the um, withdrawal season than than we did now and you can even look back in 2015 and 16 and we actually by this third week we're still injecting in those years and I think if you remember I think 2015 was the year that natural gas, fell all the way down to a dollar 30 or a dollar 50. So, you know, those markets definitely paid the price for that, you know, still injecting gas into the ground, uh, even though the season started, you know, uh, thanks to mild weather. And we can't say that this year. The other thing to keep in mind for last week's number is that it was a holiday week. And holiday weeks are just tough to gauge. Their typically estimates aren't very good for those weeks. Um, and if you are comparing here I, on this chart, I, I show this week, you know, and then this week in prior years, it looks like, well, geez, in 2014, we withdrew 122. Well, Thanksgiving fell a week later in 2014. So, you know, comparing weeks to week, you'd imagine next week's comparison to 2014. Um, will look a little bit better, but I, I, I haven't pulled that number out yet. The other thing to notice, so again, when I see these numbers, I'm really just looking for, are they still on trend? Is the trend holding of, um, you know, keeping our overall bullish picture intact? And, and this number does not change that. Five weeks from now, we could have five more numbers that change that, but this number doesn't change that. The other thing, um, just interesting to note, so from now, which current storage level now is just a little over 3,000 BCF. 
So from now until the till April, which is the end of the season, the five on the five year average, we withdraw about twenty one hundred, almost twenty two hundred. And last year we withdrew almost twenty four hundred. So that's still the most interesting and unknown unknown that exists right because if we went from here and withdrew even the five year average we would end the season with what 600 in the ground so less than 2014 one of the lowest you know years in history so nothing is changing on that i know we can look at the end of draw then the season futures and i think there's still like 1300 or something it's just because nobody knows and in that kind of narrative the reason there is so much push and pull on this is there really is two different narratives out there and mike you and i were kind of going back and forth and talking about this earlier this week with some of the stories that were out there on permian cash gas in the permian and there were a lot of headlines how it traded negative. You know, people were paying to, you know, have someone take their gas away. Now, having trade, uh, traded electricity in my life, like that is not a concept that's foreign to me. That, that used to happen often, especially um, uh, in off peak and weekend times. So it, it, it's kind of funny. Um, you know, it just says that supply cannot react as fast as demand can um, in, in an area like that. So this chart right here, you can see, we have the kind of the Texas, Louisiana, you know, region. Um, and you got, you know, your Waha, Permian area over to the east in East Texas. And, you know, that gas just doesn't have a lot of places to go. Um, and in order to get to Henry Hub, you know, it's, it's a complicated movement. Um, but once you get beyond that, right, gas can flow pretty readily to the rest of the market. And, and you see, you know, you've got Permian cash clearing down below 50 cents. Meanwhile, you know, you've got 450 gas up at Henry Hub and, you know, Midcon and Houston Ship Channel. So, so there's a supply, an isolated supply issue that makes headlines and makes people nervous to really trust this bullish case. And people talk about pipelines coming on next year. And of course, I, you know, we could go into a whole deep thing of, of, you know, overall what pipelines do to the supply, but the two main pipelines that, that they're talking about, one is to move gas from the Permian into Mexico. And the other is to move gas towards the Gulf Coast to LNG plants so that it can be liquefied and shipped overseas. So in both cases, this gas is not looking to come to the interior U.S. And, and which is why there is a supply story and there's a demand story. And, and it is amazing to me that it doesn't get talked about that much at all. You hear all the headlines, you, you know, about this excess capacity associated gas in, in the Permian. I think it was funny, Mike, when you and I were talking earlier this week, like that was even the headline you were hearing, right? Just this excess gas and that there were going to be pipelines coming on to alleviate that. Yeah. And, and then, you know, hence we had the conversation. Yeah, but the pipelines are not. So, so let's look at this chart. We've got our, our cash Permian prices here. Here's our story of production. And then we have our coastal demand areas in California and in New England. Um, now, obviously, if you could move $2 gas to a $13 market, you would do that. Um, so 
there alone, you know, you can see the constraints in pipeline capacity just in the spreads. So you have these demand stories that are clearly telling us that the market is tight. And then you have this supply narrative that because we're producing more oil in the Permian and a new oil pipeline just started up within the last couple months that is able to get more oil out of the Permian, there is now even more associated gas. But that associated gas is never going to make it to New England. And and that's just the shame um, of it all. And so now here you are trading Henry Hub. And I think it's important. And I'm, Mike, you can tell me your opinion on this, but you, you need to decide which narrative you're following when you're trading the Henry Hub contract. I yeah. mean, certainly a lot of production from the Northeast has been flowing down towards the Henry Hub. They've reversed all the pipelines, increased takeaway capacity, and therefore, you know, all summer long, they move that gas down south and it's kept prices low. But now that that gas is being used within the region, it's now flowing down towards Henry Hub. So, you, you know, you can make an argument that that makes sense, that those demand centers are pulling up Henry Hub, not because gas is flowing from Henry Hub to the East Coast, rather gas is not flowing from the Northeast or the Appalachian region down South. Yeah. Um, and no amount of Permian production is going to help that. So I, I, I like to throw that out there because I think it's, it's a, a good thing to keep in mind when you're watching the headlines come across um, and deciding, well, we, you know, the production, is the production story the winner? That, that's a pretty big picture <sighs> statement, right? You'd have to say that the fact that there will be gas flowing from the Permian to Mexico means <clears throat> there will be less gas flowing into the mid-continent or gas that had to come from somewhere else will now be displaced. Um, but that market isn't really serving anything else. Yeah. So does that make sense, Mike? Yeah, yeah. I was just reflecting on whether prices right now or in the last, in this trend, is more a story of demand or more a story of production. And with Henry Hub, I think it's more a story of demand just because of the weather. Uh, last couple of days, uh, this is kind of personal in that the last couple of days it turned colder here and I see natural gas prices run up. Kind of reminds me of being on the trading floor. You get in on a cold day in November, natural would rally. But I think the, the, what the weather will be is, is key. Um, two weeks ago, it seemed like every day when we were spiking up, and even last week, uh, it just seemed like every day there was a new forecast out for colder weather. And that drove Yeah, and bit. you know, the thing, the thing about that is, um, so, but even if you want to say, Take the five-year average drawdowns from here until April. Five years includes some really warm winters. And we're still, you know, about 2,200, right? It, I think it's really hard to look at this picture and hang your hat on the production story. Yeah. Um, given current inventory levels. Um, and then that isn't to be an outright bullish, you know, call from this price level, but I would say the market acts very bullish even in pullbacks. Yeah. And and that is something I haven't seen in a long time. And so it tells me that you know, underlying, you know, the underpinnings of this fundamental, you know, bullish story, you you can see it. It's just volatile because you know, with moves like this, you had people that were trading 10 times this size, hoping to get a penny or two a day. And now we're moving 30, 40 cents. There's just less size in the market. So any flow 
that, you know, you can even think of ETF flow, right? That has to rebalance. The market is just a little bit different now for them to come in and address that for anybody that actually has something to do. And so it's it exaggerated volatility. Uh, but even that seems to be coming in a little bit here. Um, right. I mean, still 80 some percent. But, you know, I think maybe we've readjusted to a new price level. I think we have, you know, at least qualitatively, uh, and I think traders will start scaling up. Those who will trade a lot of volume, they'll, they'll begin to recalibrate to adding more position on, I believe. The reason I think that is this week contrasts with last week and just getting markets. It was so tough last week uh, getting uh, quotes, especially in the first three months. Uh, actually, I should say first quarter because these was still on the board. The jam Fed March uh, spreads between the bid and the offer and futures were wide. Options was forget about it. It was very hard to get really good solid quotes because no market maker wanted to generate a value and just stick it out there. Yeah. Um, but this week, I, I've seen uh, uh, mark my market makers are much faster uh, making markets using these vol levels. So I think that is associated with what you're suggesting that we're kind of coming more to a. Uh, a lower vol period. Again, maybe not quantitatively, especially when you see like March $8 calls, there's like some open interest in the March 20 calls, but it feels like people are more willing to adjust their level of risk and toleration uh, to yeah, take you know, a little bit Yeah, you know, almost like we could be in a new 4 to $5 range yeah. here now until we get another kind of impetus. Yeah. yeah again, yeah, I'm but shakes, you know, us, yeah. I would be inclined to say above five, but, you know, certainly, of course, you know, we could have, you know, something that brings us into yeah. back into the three to four range. Um, seems a little too early for that, but, you know, so just, I, I, you know, kind of like to put this out here just so that people can really think to themselves and not be too, I just don't be hoodwinked by the supply story at this moment. It, I'm not saying that we don't have growing supply. I'm just saying that that headline and all that story that came out about the Permian, like, don't let that get all up in your um, judgment of, of this, you know, really what the picture is right now. Um, and then, you know, Mike, you and I like to go back and, and find the anomalies and, and look at whether it's spreads or whether it's some of the further out contracts to, to spot, you know, either a signal or an opportunity. Uh -huh. and, and we were doing that for a while with, um, you know, Dece Jan and Dece March. Now it Dece is off the board, right? And so we can take a look at, at that expiration um, and obviously the lime green is yesterday's expiration, which December expired over January. And I, I could go back and, you know, do as much history as you want, but, but then charts get so crowded. So, so let's just even consider it looking back to 2013, you know, the shale era history, um, and 2014, which is often Welcome used as our analog sort of comparison since um, inventories looked similar throughout the winter. Um, even in 2014, you couldn't get December to expire over January. Um, so clearly a sign of, of how tight the market is. You get to January and February, um, you know, we're still, Jan is, th that spread is a huge outlier, uh, you know, 15 cents plus over. Um, again, you can look back at history, look at 2014, you know, just not even anything close. I would say the only trend is often there looks to be a rally at expiration, right? <laughs> it's about the only trend you get there. Yeah. But then you get it. So then I thought, all right, let's peel back some of the outright futures, right? So let's look at the outright level that December expired at. Um, and so we have yesterday's expiration here, um, 474, whatever the final number was. 
looking back at our analog year in 2014, you know, I mean, again, we're on an outright level, ex contract expiration setting, you know, levels given, you know, since 2012. Look at January, um, current levels still sitting above 2014, although, you know, not as big of an outlier, but, but still. And then you come back and you look at June. And why did I do that? Well, at the end of 2014, I think inventory, I apologize, I don't have it right in front of me, but I know it was under 1,000, 850 maybe, I forget the exact number, but that's how we ended you know, that winter season. And the reason, and by, but by the end of that summer, we had more than refilled inventory. Um, I mean, people literally were worried. That, I mean, and it was bullish all summer that we weren't going to get, since we started from such low levels, that we wouldn't, you know, be able to produce enough to fill inventory. And you can look at where June futures expired, June 2014, you know, almost four, uh, 460 ish, 450. And the interesting thing that happened that summer was that. Prices rose to a level that incented production and destroyed demand. So PowerGen, for example, was you know was not competitive in the stack uh, as as competitive. How about this? As competitive as it is now. Sure, we have coal plant re retirements and blah blah blah. But you know, if we're just you know trying to overall take a big picture look at this. And now we, you know, come out to, and everybody knows, right? Nobody will touch. I mean, they barely want to buy the winter contracts in this because people are so, you know, married to the, you know, the supply narrative. Um, and so they're definitely not going to buy the summer. And, you know, just kind of like we pointed out March a few months ago, right? Where, where shorts were being placed there. And, and you never know um, when the market is going to change its mind on, on that being the end of winter. You know, I think it's just keep in the back of your mind, right? Now we've got summer uh, 2019 at 270. And I mean, look, I'm sure you probably have producers that are still trying to buy puts, you know, to protect that, um, you know, a downside to $2 or something. And, and you know, that certainly could happen. However, prices that low, we just went through a summer with prices that low and we saw what happened. We saw that there was demand coming out of the woodwork, and we actually were not able to put as much in the ground as we expected. Um, you know, you just got all these power plants, these combined cycles that can run gas, and and you know, gas priced itself very competitively in the stack. So, I think it's worth at least considering that that price level might not work for what a, an end of storage level below a thousand um regardless of the you know the actual production picture only because at that price level we have too much demand and i'm sure mike it, you've seen that story even in crude oil yeah so thoughts on on summer and, and my theory about price yeah. levels? Uh, what I'm looking at right here as you're uh, talking about June, I'm looking at two things. I'm looking at the June straddle. You know, I just went back to the March. So June. Oh, I love how you you always bring it right to the, <laughs> I love it. I but love I, it. I'm looking at the June 280 straddle. That hasn't changed. Uh, that was the, the straddle uh, at the beginning of the day. Uh, that's about 38 cents value with a very low 52% vol. <laughs> no, but that, so that, that straddle is 38 cents. I'm surprised it's that high. I thought June vol was 30 or something. Uh, I kind of, yeah, the, uh, let's, let me make sure, you know, I'm sorry, uh, 25%. Sorry, I was looking at, the, oh, yeah, okay. I was looking okay. at the Delta there. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. 20, 25%. I appreciate that. Uh, good catch, but thir 38 cents value. Right for yeah. April that has um, sorry for June that has 180 days, but for 
March. I, lo- I love that. Yeah. Okay, see, so you boil it right down to the thing. And you know what? Um, I wouldn't have bought that the last several years. But, you know, now, like, I, sure, I guess, you know, everybody thinks this production story is going to bring us down to $2. Okay, fine. Well, then the straddle's still a good buy. But, I, you know, I think you could make a case also for we need to get prices to give us some demand destruction. Yeah. By the way, a seller of that straddle at 38 cents to 280 is looking at a range that they want the market to stay in from roughly 240 to 320, which for the summer, even given this winter, would not be a shock if we ultimately settled back in that range, unless something uh, secular has happened in, in the market where we're going to now start seeing $4. Yeah. Well, you know, that is kind of my favorite chart where I, I, I look at how um, over the last, since 2012, cash prices and how we kind of in the summer we get boxed. We've been boxed yeah. in this range for years, several years. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, you're either betting that the inventory situation has an, an end of inventory levels has zero bearing on the summer range. Yeah. Or you're betting that there is a step change in the level, right? Yeah. I, I just, I don't know that I'd bet against a step change in the level. And and that's, you're betting, the seller of that is betting we come back into this range. You know, it seems like that'd be, that's a, been a historical case that's existed. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I've got that one on my, on my radar screen. I mean, yeah. obviously winter is awesome to trade right now, but, um, you know, sometimes the moves get a little bit too big and, yeah. and it gets well, hard to even, um, you know, kind of play when it gets all messy like this. And, and so you start looking at other things. Yeah. By and, the way, to, to I, reflect that, uh, the, speaking of winter, the March 405 straddle, that looks like it's about a uh, $1.35 uh, with uh, 87% vol. Right. And uh, uh, well, hence the yeah. March, April spread. Right. Yeah. And I mean, like that whole thing, you know, that's all, that's the lottery ticket yeah. of we think everything goes completely back to normal in the summer. How, you know, and it just falls off of a cliff like that. I mean, it never does at expiration. Right. right. The two of them converge at oh. expiration. Yeah. I appreciate you pointing out the June. I'm going to start keying on that. And as far as what I've seen in terms of the flow of business, I, I haven't seen a lot of trading. Again, you know, producer, bank intermediary type. I haven't seen a lot for the summer 19 yet. Some pricing, but no, you know, not a lot of action yet. And, uh, uh, well, and yeah, because, you know, you again, putting it, it's good to look at them. Yeah. Of course, why put something on it? It just eats up your capital yeah. and you get zero on it for until you do. Right. Yeah. So it was the same thing with buying, you know, winter all summer. Um, but you could, you know, you saw that when it happened, it happened. Yeah. And, and so that you, sometimes you got to kind of take the long pain for um, the, you know, duration pain and so that you're in it when when something happens and and I don't see any interesting like time spreads calendar spreads that would give you any real thing you know within the summer months so same same at this point Um, but again I mean you know still obviously not like winter's over and and you know we're not talking about that anymore it's just you know I think we've got a new range here and I think we are going to have some more surprises to the upside. So, and you can tell that the market thinks that too on pullbacks, right? Yeah. Even though they're kind of severe, um, you know, we're just waiting for the next thing. And, you know, we got uh, next week's weather, maybe a little warmer Then the following going to be colder, you know, so we're just going to swap back and forth here until then we get the next um, cold thing. And I think the good news is, Vol is coming off enough that y- you can dip your toe back in the water on some of these upside yeah. calls, you know, and, you know, they're more expensive than they were, but not even remotely yeah. um, when we had that initial blowout. So, so we'll, you know, that you can get, 
you can get some upside back if the, if if that's a lot of people. It seems like they just like to you know play this upside mm-hmm. call thing in in Jan, Feb, and March. So those those are becoming a little bit more realistic. And then just before we move on to oil here, let's let's just take a look again at I, I like to look at the overall complex, right? LNG versus some of the futures curves at basis locations, and you can see in this. Cyan, I guess is the name of that color here on the bottom. We got Permian, we've got our Henry Hub kind of, you know, the Henry Hub is, I, I know I say this, but it's like the it's like the index, the clearing index of everything else, right? It's like the S&P or, you know, it's the average. So you've got your production story, um, you know, kind of bringing up the rear. And then you have, obviously you see your demand region spike up. Um, as we get, you know, winter, obviously we consume more than we produce. Um, and, and that has some sort of averaged effect on Henry Hub. Um, I would say the only thing I've noted over the last month is how the LNG markets have actually sold off. Um, Asian LNG was easily $12.50, $13 for Jan Feb. A little over a month ago, the whole LNG complex has sort of sold off. Now, is that a result of them having access to, you know, cheap gas in from the U.S.? Hard to say since that's kind of, you know, fixed picture for how much capacity there is. But anyway, interesting that now we see, especially New England and Algonquin, it's blown right past even the LNG you know, market that it tries to compete with so that it can, you know, import, which which it already has, they've started to import just a little bit last week um, of LNG. And it really is now pricing at heating oil futures. So I, I think there was one day and probably happened again yesterday um, where January Algonquin futures are over January heating oil futures um, on an MMBTU adjusted basis. So, you know, the markets will run up to the price they need for the next fuel um, that's available to them. And it's obvious that natural gas is not available <laughs> to the East Coast or, or it wouldn't run up that high. Um, but it is also very much a sign of tightness. I think in years when when the market, not last year, it was very, actually we had some very tight Northeast markets last year, but prior to that, you know, before the winter, Algonquin would, you know, basis would run up and, and maybe we the futures outright would look like 10 to $12, only to end up clearing $2 just <laughs> because there's a bust in the winter and, and we had so much supply. So I think it's completely the opposite of that this year. And I look forward to the headlines in January of 150 something dollar cash gas on the East Coast, um, which some get as much headline as negative prices for the Permian. (laughs) So speaking of that, Mike, um, you've seen, I guess that's, I didn't, I don't have an oil chart up, but you, um, you know, we had this big move in the oil curve, and and we talked a little bit about Contango bringing some more producers into the market, and how has that? And and, and we were talking about that at sixty dollars. Now here we are at fifty. What have you seen change? Um, with the uh, the Contango, uh, just before we went on the air. The Cal 19 was about 85 cents below Cal 20. Um, the that, that's the biggest discount from Cal 19 to Cal 20 that I've seen. Yeah. And, and uh, um, that it was interesting because a couple of weeks ago uh, we saw that. Hang on one sec. Yeah, and you know, I think that always means like Mike ends up seeing customers come in and roll out all their hedges then from like 19 
out to 20 yeah. once that moves into contango yeah thanks uh, I'm, I'm back here the um uh so last week the 19 which had been in a discount of about 40 cents to cal 20 made a little bit of a comeback and for a brief time last week i think it was maybe thursday uh even though the market was heading south cal 19 and cal 20 were a parity and i thought maybe that's a signal that contango's over and we're going to switch back uh, to at least flat, maybe not backward, right. Asian, at least flat in the back in the in the front months. But ever since that little spurt, it's reverted back to a discount and a growing discount, and that discount has grown from Cal 19, uh, 85 cents underneath the price of Cal 20. Um, you know, so and Cal 19 is about 52 dollars. Cal 20 is about 53 dollars. And the thing is, I mean, that's so, I mean, that, you know, 85 cents, right? Contango for on the cows. It's not minimizing it. It's just, you know, when I think about it, trying, you know, because it, it appears as though the overall sentiment, obviously, right, is now so bearish on crude oil. And when I think of really bearish crude oil, I think of real severe Contango. And especially in the front months. And, and, you know, we don't have that because we have, I guess, I was going to say one thing, but two things. One being room in storage. Right. Right? We, I mean, we're not, we could be building for the next year, right, before we would get um, Cushing, at least, back up to danger levels. Um, and we have exports. So I, you know, I wonder anymore, like, I wonder if that's going to keep Contango in a tighter range or, you know, from it being such a severe discount or, or maybe am I really saying, I mean, is it that, I, I don't know that this oil market is that bearish. Yeah. Or the, the, you know, the, the super Contangos, I think we used to call them. Yeah, we did. Yeah. After the, you know, 2008, after the financial crisis and the, and the drop in oil, that first quarter, uh, that container was like nine dollars under. I remember. Right. You know, uh, the front months were way below the rest of the price curve, and I think we kind of reached those levels one more time. Not quite as deep of a contango, but we really haven't seen that. I think we may have reverted back to a more regular storage economics perspective of you know you could de determine the cost of carry. Because I never understood when we got that deep of contango, you know, the, all the rules of storage economics get thrown out of the window in terms of cost of carry, et cetera. Well, it switches to to a new um, new pl new inventory method, right? You're not you're no yeah. longer putting it in a tank at Cushing, right? You're putting it on a truck, and then you fill that up, and then you're putting it on a cargo tanker offshore, right? So yeah, yeah. It, it, it's starting to, it, it's telling you that that level of contango is telling you how much it's running out of room to put um, oil in the ground. And and I guess I just have to say that, you know, I, I similar almost to me is in natural gas where, you know, there's kind of this, you, you can find this really bearish narrative, right? About this production story. Same, you know, there is, obviously a lot more waivers and I mean, you know, you can go on and on in crude oil. And yet, like to me, it, it's not, it's not as bearish as this price action has been is not as bearish as, you know, as, as the spreads are, you know, like they don't reflect that. And Unless you know we're expecting that what we're going to go back into one dollar, two dollar, three dollar, we're suddenly going to see where nobody wants to take delivery of the front month contract, and you know all of a sudden at expiration it blows out to five dollars. Um, you know, I, since we are not in that setting, I I think crude is very vulnerable to the upside. Bryn, what do you think the chances are uh, of with the OPEC meeting coming up and there's no agreement on any cut of production, can we not only see lower prices, but can we begin to see 
the idea of what you just said that I don't want this crude anymore and, and then we can see a deeper contango. Is that how well, would you think? Would you so rate that we, as a possibility? So, so what I think is that it is, we, you know, we all now know how much a narrative can take over, can govern um, price action and can, you know, populate the mindset of everybody. Uh -huh. and, and that's fine, right? And then you, you usually you look for evidence of, of that narrative, right? And so you're suggesting that it could be possible after, you know, the OPEC meeting and if there's no cuts that we might start to see evidence of this narrative in a really blowing out contango. Um, I guess I, and that could, sure. I mean, then, then that would, certainly would be if we start to see that slipping, right? Then, you know, it's beyond just a narrative. Yeah. And now I think it's a narrative that um, it, it, I don't think by next week, we, we will not have places to stuff the oil. You know what I mean? It's not like, like we're already sticking it everywhere and people's swimming pools in the backyard. I mean, that used to be the joke, right? Like, you know, people are filling up their swimming pool in the backyard. There's just nowhere to put the oil. Um, not saying we don't have a lot of production and, and that hasn't, and it, it's a buyer's market for sure. Right. But I don't know that next week that we could see that happen. You know what? We already know what storage levels are, right? I, I don't, I don't think we could go from what, what are we? 30 something and Cushing to 98 in one week. Um, but ma maybe it's the beginning of that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, you know, I just, I don't see the, I see the evidence of a narrative, but I don't really see the evidence in prices of um, real conviction. Yeah. Uh, one place, if you did have some bearish conviction, by the way, yeah. um, looking at the Jan crude option, uh, fifty dollar put. Right. So it's, it's a little over. It's close to a dollar sixty. Um, but I'm not so much analyzing that value. But I'm just looking at its open interest. We talked about this a little bit earlier before we went on the air. The open interest in the fifty put for January. Yeah. Uh, is relatively large for a put strike. Uh, the 50 puts, as of yesterday, had uh, over 16,000, close to 17,000 open. And that's just yeah. NYMEX, right? That's not Yeah, that's right. just, just yeah. NYMEX. It's, yeah. it's not Cal average stuff. It's just the CL uh, F yeah. contract. Um, well, I mean, this market loves yeah. to pin, doesn't it? So, yeah. um, But again, I, I could see that happening, meaning that the whole curve falls there, right? Yeah. Um, About 15, 16 sort of days. Changing right. the overall. Yeah. And and I maybe this market's not going to move into that much contango because it doesn't want to give producers the incentive um, to you know keep production and ramp up production. So we might have low price levels with zero incentive. Yeah, for uh, the from a, a producer point of view, uh, where I would empathize with is even at the low price levels. If you have year 2020 trading at a nice premium to uh, 2019, th that could be a really good pricing opportunity. Again, regardless of the flat price level, just uh, the curve shaped in a way to sell a higher priced uh, time period back there than selling you know, in backwardation. Yeah, the curve structure like that, yeah. um, sort of helps keep a capital expenditure budget in place mm. to the extent that it's not offset by outright price levels, right? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Well, good. Um, I know um, they told us we could go a little bit long here today and, and we took full advantage of that. Um, anything else that, that, that we missed, Mike, that you wanted to get off your chest? No, that, the highlight for me this week, even though I'm not seeing a great deal of action with you know, this price movement, is especially with natural gas options, uh, things are returning to a little bit more, uh, even though there's high volatility, things are returning to a bit more calm 
where Absolutely. You, know, you, can, you can get in and out of markets much better. You can get markets when you're looking at different structures and things that have a, a nice long term to them. It's, it's easier getting markets this week, even at these levels of vol, than it has been for the last couple of weeks. So that's why. Yeah, great point. We're, ta we're not talking this week about people blowing up or anything. We're back no. to talking about what's the opportunity, right? Yeah. So again, I don't know if that necessarily makes you sell volatility, but at least qualitatively, things are less volatile than the option premium tends to imply right now, in, in my opinion. For sure. Especially yeah. in oil. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Good to talk to you again, Mike. And um, we'll be back next week. And if anyone has any um, topics or, or, you know, angles that you want us to cover, just drop them in, in the chat room and we'll um, add them to our list for next week. All right. Otherwise, have a great afternoon, Michael, and, and same to everyone else. Thanks, Brent. Thanks, everybody.